Welcome to our Zoom video tele-town hall. I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. I'm here at home like so many of you. I want to start with a thank you to our first responders. Uh, you may overhear my daughter in the background and uh, she likes to participate in as many of the uh, activities at home as possible. Uh, so I just want to thank all of you. I want to welcome our fellow elected officials, our Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, our speaker, Corey Johnson, who's joined us, our borough president, Gail Brewer, state senator, Liz Kruger, who is on the call as we speak, uh, assembly member, Rebecca Seawright. Uh, we're also co-sponsored by assembly member, Dan Court, and council member, Keith Powers. Um, I wanna first turn to, uh, uh, to state senator, Liz Kruger, to give a brief welcome and uh, thank you to folks. We've got about 100 folks on this call. Uh, you're on Zoom right now for those who are dialed in and for those watching on Facebook Live. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, delighted to be here with you from my home. I am actually shocked that I figured this system out on my own. Um, and I, as I'm sure all of you are learning how we communicate with the world being under lockdown. And like I talked to my staff about, um, we're, we're there every day. We're trying to be there for you. And you can continue to reach out to our offices and anything we can do, we will help figure out for you. And we do daily updates about changes we are learning about. Um, and we are all waiting to that day where someone who knows what they're talking about announces to us, okay, you can leave your homes again. You can continue your lives. And also shout out to all the first responders who of course include the people who go to food stores every day and who make deliveries to people. Um, there are so many heroes and heroines um, throughout the city of New York who are doing amazing work under the most difficult circumstances. And I fear that we will have more people to hug and offer to support to after this is over and we learn how many people we have lost that we personally knew during this tragic time. So again, Ben, thank you for hosting this. And I know that we as elected officials are all committed to doing anything we can for our district. Thank you, State Senator uh, Kruger, and thank you uh, for all that you do in Albany. Next up, our leader for the city and the city council, our speaker, Corey Johnson. I just want to thank Corey because uh, he's actually one of the reasons that we closed our office back on March 11th, uh, based on some of his concerns. And soon after, the, the mayor and governor did follow suit. He's been a real leader in terms of getting the uh, council to do what's right, encouraging private sector to do what's right, and for really connecting with international, uh, international medical leaders and other leaders to try to make sure we're doing the right things here in the city. Please join me in welcoming uh, Speaker Corey Johnson. Uh, thank you, Ben. It's nice to see all of you. You know, I've been doing so many of these Zoom conferences every day in the midst of so much tragedy and heartache and trauma and grief. Uh, it has been actually really, um, like medicine to me to see the faces of so many New Yorkers, to actually connect with people, uh, to see folks that are together, but also to connect with folks that are living alone and that are single. Even though we are socially distancing and we are physically isolated, it's really important that we stay emotionally connected to each other. And these Zoom, these Zoom conferences allow for that. I don't wanna speak for too long because I know there are a lot of folks that are gonna talk. I know that my colleague, uh, Keith Powers is on as well. And there are other elected officials. I saw the borough president was on and I saw Dr. Barbeau from the health department is on. I just wanna say uh, just broadly, I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Barbeau and the health department folks speak about what's happening right now as it relates to the social distancing measures and the good effect that they're having, as well as the building up of our uh, hospital capacity. We're doing those two things at the same time. The thing I wanna quickly focus on, and I'll, make it, I'll try to make it quick, is we have this crisis. We have the healthcare crisis, the hospitalization crisis, uh, the, the pandemic, and then you have this economic crisis that is happening at the same time where so many people 
have become imperiled in a short period of time. We're seeing the reports of the State Department of Labor Unemployment uh, Office not being able to answer for folks that have been trying to call in because they've been inundated. We've seen the toll on our small businesses, on freelancers and gig economy workers and domestic workers, and everyone who has lost their economic security over the last few weeks. Uh, we at the council are focused on this. We can't do it alone. Uh, we have to partner with our great allies who are on this call from the state, as well as our federal partners. And I know that Congresswoman Maloney and her staff are gonna be on this call or already on this call, uh, but we need more money. You know, the current fiscal year that we're in, in uh, right now, we're projecting uh, at least a $2 billion loss for the city of New York of the current fiscal year we're in. We're not even talking about next fiscal year on the budget that we're seeking to adopt. That number could be uh, at the low end $3 billion, at the high end much higher. So we're gonna see one of the largest economic hits the city of New York has ever seen. And what we need, especially out of Washington uh, in this next stimulus bill, and I know that uh, Congressman Baloney has been working very hard as well as Congressman Nadler and the rest of our congressional delegation. We need money for localities that make up for the lost revenue, for the lost sales tax revenue, for the lost personal income tax revenue, for all of that lost revenue. I and the council put out a plan a few weeks ago calling for a, to start the conversation off a $12 billion rescue package to help New Yorkers. We are gonna go through this difficult process my North Star in this budget process is to look out for the most vulnerable. We are already seeing major issues with food pantries across New York City. 32% of food pantries have closed across the city of New York, which is horrible. And the reason why they've closed is that the vast majority of them are run by volunteers. And the vast majority of those volunteers are seniors, are retired people who can't leave their homes right now. And so uh, we asked the state and the wonderful state legislators on this call, we're able to get $25 million in emergency funds for, emergency, for food pantries and emergency food. The city, we are seeking to get a matching $25 million in the next couple of days to be able to reopen these pantries and to make sure they can hire full-time staff members to make sure we are getting food to the people that need it. At the council, we're focused on what's happening in our homeless shelters what's happening for homeless New Yorkers, what's happening for domestic violence survivors and victims, what's happening on Rikers Island, what's happening for the most vulnerable right now. That is going to be our North Star because there are gonna be very painful, difficult budget decisions that are going to be made over the next couple of months. And we need to make sure we're helping the most number of New Yorkers, especially those that are newly in poverty, that are newly economically insecure, what can we do? The really scary thing about that big number that we're talking about in the billions of dollars is it's gonna impact essential city services. It's gonna impact all of our city agencies. And we need to be thoughtful about how we handle that. I know the borough president who is the best is on this call and she has been through difficult budgets in the past herself when she was on the council. So I will keep it at that and just let you know that my, uh, my heart is full when I do these calls to see so many New Yorkers in their homes across the city. And it's important that we have hope. It's important in this moment of darkness and trauma and grief, we have hope. We got through the fiscal crisis of the 1970s together. We got through September 11th together. We got through the Great Recession of 2009 together. We got through Hurricane Sandy together. We will get through this together. This is different. It's bigger. It's more scary because we're alone, some of us. But we will get through this. New York City is the greatest city in the world, not because of our geography, but because of our people, because of the 8.6 million New Yorkers that are the beating heart and soul of this city. We will get through this if we are unified, if we are united, if we are kind and compassionate, and if we look out for one another. That needs to be our top priority to get through the difficult days and weeks ahead. I wanna thank you, Ben, for hosting this. I apologize for speaking too long, and I look forward to hearing from all of the constituents that have questions for those of us in government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, for that in-depth update. Uh, and on to our Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. 
Oh, thank you very much, Ben. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So for, thank you for doing this. Um, it never uh, is too much to share information, and I really appreciate your leadership, and I want to thank the commissioner. There's a couple of things that uh, I want to be hopeful, but there are a lot of people dying, <clears throat> and, and it makes it hard, different from all the other uh, tragedies that I have been through. But anyway, we have a web we have a website. We have a <coughs> sorry, we have a um, newsletter that also comes out every day, and people are welcome to get it on our website. So in our office, we've been doing about five different things that I can focus on. First of all, the very first effort I made was trying to make sure that the garment center manufacturers and people from EDC were connected. That was almost three weeks ago now. But I am happy that there are contracts locally. God knows we need all the uh, surgical gowns and masks and uh, face shields that we can get. And there's a group called Atta Fruit in Manhattan, which is the only manufacturing, I think, left. And they are doing some of the shields, as is those in Brooklyn and elsewhere. So I have to say EDC has been very helpful. They screen everybody. We all get tons and tons of, I am from uh, you know, so-and-so, and I have lots of masks. They all have to be uh, vetted, and they've been doing a great job. The hospitals, as the commissioner knows, are very challenged. I am totally supportive of the work that she's been doing, and Dr. Katz at H&H &H Health and Hospital in East Harlem. Um, we've been helpful to Metropolitan with getting them food, and certainly all the kind of PPE we can, and the same thing with uh, the folks there at Harlem Hospital, but it is very, very hard. Uh, we've gotten them masks, we've gotten them donations, but you can never do enough. The other thing I wanna mention is just food, because as we talk about the recovery and all of the jobs, we still don't have this food down. Catherine Garcia is phenomenal as the food czar and Kate McKenzie, but um, the seniors still do not have at the centers the list of to whom their food is supposed to go to. We have been waiting three weeks. So that's something that needs to have to be addressed without getting into all the details. Our seniors are perhaps the most vulnerable. They can't leave. They can't go to the schools where there are many, many opportunities for um, the food hubs. They have to stay home and they have to have food. I want to thank Fresh Direct because we have gone from the top of Manhattan to the bottom of Manhattan to the NYCHA developments, dropping off 400 packets uh, once a week. We, we do it five days a week. They're 10 pound food boxes and Fresh Direct has been phenomenal. We go ourselves, we have our own van, we take them to different NYCHAs where there's a center uh, location where uh, Fresh Direct goes. And then we move the boxes to different NYCHAs in the area. So great, 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 great kudos to Fresh Direct. But I still want to say this food has not got a channel. You call 311, you don't necessarily get the food and the senior centers do not know exactly who they are supposed to be uh, focused on. Um, there's been an issue which I hope gets resolved with food for Passover. Uh, we have obviously a lot of senior centers that there is kosher only, and it is still, I think at this moment, it has not been resolved, although many, many attempts have been made. That has got to be done. I did spend quite a bit of time today because as the uh, speaker said we have to think to the future, which is hard when you see um, all the challenges that we're facing. But at some point there will be a recovery and the business improvement districts, I had a conference call with all of them today in Manhattan. And they really are very focused on ways in which between open space, um, relaxing some of the challenges that small businesses face from, you know, fines and fees to when they can open their outdoor cafes, etc. They have a long list. Because people are still going to uh, make sure they're distant from their neighbors, I think, even after this recovery. There's, the whole world is going to be very different. And God knows we need to save as many small businesses as possible. The 125th Street biz, business right now, for instance, can't get employees. So some of the large retails, national chains are open, but the lines are really long because the, the, the uh, manager and the owners can't get anybody to go to work because they're afraid and they don't have enough PPE even in that retail situation. I just want to say people are coming out of the hospital. Thank God they're coming out of the hospitals. Thank God for our hospitals. But sometimes they go home and they need a home health aid. Or sometimes they go to Isabella or Jewish Home or some of the other wonderful east side uh, facilities where you can get rehab, but then you still might need a, 
somebody to help you and help you get home and help you get around, and that's a home health aide who does not have necessarily the PPE. So I just wanna add that to the list of the people who need, because I can tell you they're not coming to work if they don't have the proper attire and they shouldn't. And then just finally, uh, something that uh, Ben knows better than I, but this is gonna change the world technologically. We all know that. And uh, he and I and others have been talking about this for the schools and the community-based organizations and the city agencies for a long time. I'm a big, huge fan of uh, Jessica Tisch, who's the new head to do it, and all the other people, John Paul Farmer, and others who are around the mayor in terms of technology. But I just think this is the time as we recover, because we do need to be optimistic about the future, working with the federal government and the city government and all the challenges that it provides. Uh, we need to figure out what the tech needs are of the city and be very cognizant of them. Obviously, the school kids and the teachers are trying. They tried Zoom. DOE doesn't like Zoom. I understand that. So now we're on to Microsoft Team or Google, uh, some of the Google opportunities that exist. We've got to figure all that out. Um, and uh, finally, I just want to give big kudos to Tim Wu, who is a professor at uh, Columbia Law School, and he's working with some of the small companies and nonprofits to help figure out the very complicated federal application for the CARE Act. Again and again, thank you very much, Ben Kalos. Thank you to our borough president. Uh, as soon as we finish with the elected official reports, we're going to get straight to having our commissioner for the Department of Health answer some questions. So I'm going to turn it over to our Congressmember, America's Congressmember, Carolyn Maloney, who just passed the federal stimulus, uh, a second stimulus bill, uh, and her, she is the first woman chair of the uh, Oversight Committee, which will actually do oversight over this new multi-trillion dollar stimulus program. Thank you so much, uh, Ben Kalos, uh, for, for bringing us together and making this happen, and all of my colleagues in government, I, I'm proud to serve with you. You're Work helps me be more act active and creative in Washington because you're doing such a great job while I'm off in D.C. Uh, I must say that these are difficult times, but we are rising to the occasion. Congress passed uh, three bills very quickly. They are disaster relief bills. Uh, most importantly was the last one. It was over $2.2 trillion, the largest uh, grant relief program in history, and it's uh, is really uh, pumping money into people. When we got the bill from the Republicans, it was all about how to save uh, the big corporations, and we made the money go directly to people, first in the form of unemployment benefits, and, uh, and then uh, we sent it to our hospitals and uh, all over the place. But, but uh, first of all, in the unemployment, uh, we will be uh, giving uh, uh, 1,200 uh, a grant, a, a special grant program that uh, will be going to people directly, and then uh, 2,000, uh, 2,000, uh, 2,400 for couples. Uh, the unemployment insurance, we have a benefit of $600 above the unemployment compensation benefit that the workers get uh, when they're laid off. Uh, so the first time we will cover not only the self-employed workers, but also the big economy, the artists and the, and the uh, musicians and the others in our, our, in our economy. Uh, over 15 billion will be coming to New York directly from this program and, uh, and other areas. For our hospitals, we have a $150 billion program. Uh, billions of it will flow to New York. The, the formula, our hospitals are very happy with it because it reimburses uh, not only with grants uh, for, uh, for research and care, but directly for the care you're providing for each coronavirus uh, a patient. And uh, it, it's much needed for, for, our, for our hospitals that are on the front line. New York, no city can handle a crisis better than New York. Uh, after 9-11, Sandy, the crash of 2008. But what we're confronting now is probably the, the biggest uh, challenge we've ever had. Uh, fourth up, uh, and I'm proud to have taken the lead in pushing for mass transit money, and uh, we've received uh, over $25 billion nationally and, and the $4.35 billion that the MTA uh, requested exclusively for them. And, and then a very, very important program on small business loans. Uh, 
This, uh, this program is crashing the banks. It's an SBA loan. I, I spoke to the head of uh, Bank of America, and he said he had over 112 applicants in one day. We had only 60,000 in the entire SBA uh, program last year. We're getting uh, over 100,000 at our banks. Our major banks that are SBA loan, loan uh, givers are Bank of America and Chase and Wells Fargo. Uh, we are trying to expand that out into PayPal and other uh, Quicken loans and others because the demand is so huge. The demand has so, been so huge on this $375 billion program that we are trying to put $200 billion more into it on Thursday with a, another vote on Thursday to extend this program. The PPP program, the Paycheck uh, uh, Fairness Program, it's a, a great program for small businesses. They call it a loan, but it's really a, a, a grant. And you, uh, you get a SBA loan. It can go for two years. You have to keep 75% of your personnel on. 25% of the loan can go for rent and other utilities and expenses that you have. But at the end of eight weeks, if you've kept your uh, people on and paid them, then you get the whole loan forgiven. So it's a tremendous loan. Uh, Loan. We, other, we have a larger loan. This is for businesses under 500 employees. We have a, a, a larger loan for businesses over 500 employees, but that also works during this period. And we have emergency appropriations, uh, uh, you know, 180 million that would bring some uh, billions for hard hit airports. We've, uh, we've expanded the food program, the SNAP program, funding for child care. Uh, we received uh, 162 million in nutrition for seniors, nearly one billion dollars to help homes uh, be needed and uh, face income problems that we're confronting for our less uh, affluent uh, members. One 1.5 billion for the National Guard uh, to help the hardest hit states. Uh, they are now in New York City. We put up roughly five hospitals in one week. First with the boat, the Comfort. Boat. The, the hospital in Central Park, they put up a 10 hospital in three days. They're converting, of course, the Javits Center and the Billie Jean King Center for the overflow of our hospitals. And uh, a lot of funding for the, uh, the equipment. One of the biggest problems we're confronting is the personnel in the hospitals. Many of them are sick. And uh, I push very hard to have a priority a testing for, for our first responders in our hospitals that, that are exposed so much to the coronavirus. And some of the hospitals are now putting them on a priority list to be tested. Um, but we are working hard, but we're not finished. We're, we're moving forward, uh, first with this grant this uh, Thursday, I'm told. Of course, everything's fluid in Congress. The minute they tell you the plan, they change the plan. And in fact, in the, uh, in the small business alone, program, they kept changing the guidance. They've already changed it three, three times, and it hasn't even been out uh, for a week and a half. So a lot of this is fluid, and they're constantly changing. I look forward to the feedback from my colleagues and others on other items that we need to put in yet the fourth uh, disaster relief program <laughs> that will focus on uh, really uh, economic uh, revival and, and uh, are getting our economy moving again. Uh, so it's been a, a challenge. My favorite part of the day is going out at 7 o'clock when the hotel shift happens, or rather the hospital shift happens uh, in my neighborhood and people are walking home. There's such a unity of young and old, uh, children, uh, elderly, uh, all nationalities, hanging out the windows, pen, beating on pens, whistling, applauding, uh, screaming, uh, uh, putting off horns and all types of expressions to say thank you uh, to the workers that are on the first line uh, defending all of us uh, and protecting those that are, are, are suffering with the coronavirus. Uh, we reached the highest number of deaths uh, that we've had so far, over 700. Uh, we were hoping that we were going to start leveling off. Uh, I hope there will be more of a leveling off and dropping tomorrow. I, I uh, send out a newsletter of what's happening in Congress every single day. You can get it from my website or my campaign website as a campaign one also on the topic that gives the numbers of uh, infected and 
the success of those that, that are being released uh, from the hospitals and uh, and truly uh, we need to support our, our hospitals and our, and our workers, our, our nurses, our emergency technicians, doctors and all. Uh, all I can say is that I've never been busier. We are on conference calls every single day uh, with Congress, uh, uh, really responding to, to the emergency as best we can. It's my privilege to work with all of you and again, Ben, and all of you on the, the, on the listening in today, uh, thank you so much uh, for your concern and your hard work in reacting to this uh, crisis. And I yield back. Thank you to Congressmember Maloney for all your great work in D.C. Uh, we're now going to move on to our State Assembly Member Rebecca Searight, who has her own call at 7. I just want to remind folks who want to get to these calls because we only get the commissioner for another half an hour. Uh, one other key thing is Zoom is currently limiting us to 100. We actually paid for an upgraded plan. We're trying to work with them to get that limit uh, removed. We're number 92 in their waiting list queue, but uh, for anyone you know who's trying to get on, they can see the view on Facebook. And if uh, you, and so we're trying to get as many people on. I'll turn it over to Assemblymember Rebecca Seawright. Thank you, Ben, and thank you for hosting this. And yes, I wanna invite all of you to tune in at seven o'clock to our town hall this evening, focusing on senior citizens. And, also, thank you to our borough president and all the electeds, America's Congresswoman, Carolyn Maloney, and I see my other council member, Keith Powers, on the screen here. So thank you. We uh, returned back from Albany, and I just want to talk a little bit quickly about the state budget. Let's face it, we can't escape the fact that this was a difficult year with an extraordinary stress on revenues. The adopted state budget assumes a $10 billion shortfall. Later this month, the governor will present an assessment of state revenues along with a plan of action. The legislature will have 10 days to improve an alternate plan. The adopted budget is dependent on additional federal funding desperately needed to jumpstart our state economy. And despite the deficit, the state budget in its current form represents a resolute effort to maintain support for critical initiatives, initiatives that are important to all of us. These include $3 billion for the MTA capital plan, for subway and bus improvements, new statutory bonding capacity for the MTA, from 55.497 billion to 91.1 billion, 27.9 billion in education funding. That's an increase of 93.2 million. A three billion environmental bond act for flood risk reduction, water quality improvement, land con conservation and recreation. More money for pre-K, which I know Councilman Kalos has worked so hard on here on the Upper East Side. Sick leave benefits for private sector employees, new felony criminal status for violent hate crimes, campaign finance reforms with public matching funds, and 20 million for electric buses to help improve our air quality. Just today, I was on the phone with the president of Kohler Hospital and the Roosevelt Island Medical Center. Um, there was a refrigerated truck out front parked, and we're hearing all kinds of rumors that the existing Kohler residents are um, being exposed to the COVID virus. So we're working very hard to get them on more personal equipment. They, on Cornell Tech Campus on the island, they've made 50 masks. We're gonna be delivering that with a lot of personal equipment next week with the Open Doors nonprofit program. So we're uh, working hard to monitor the situation with Kohler on Roosevelt Island. Um, my office is coordinating a food delivery to senior citizens. We need five more volunteers at the Stanley Isaac Center, so please call our office at 212-288-4607 if you'd like to volunteer to leave food outside uh, doors. And I just want to thank you all for tuning in tonight. Our state budget provides a lot of flexibility and innovation to move forward as this crisis recedes, but we will recover and we will rise together. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, our, our last elected official report, and then we'll head to the main event, is uh, Council Member Keith Powers, who shares the Upper East Side. Thank you. I want to thank Council Member Kalos and all my colleagues for uh, all the work you're doing. I know we're all trying to work in our own districts to help everybody out, and thank you for putting together this event. I'm going to keep it really short because I know the Department of Health is the main event here, so I just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, thank you to the Department of Health. They're working so hard, and we really owe so much to them for getting information out and 
really uh, working with our healthcare first responders. Just for your own sake, uh, my office has been working with constituents every day, whether it's about small businesses in the district or unemployment, helping people get to the resources they need, whether it's about rents and landlord issues, we are happy to help as much as we can when it comes to food access and you need to get a, a hot meal or you're having trouble uh, accessing some of the food in the city, we want to be helpful to that. Department of Education, Technology, how to get your kid properly ready to be learning every single day. Um, use our office as much as you possibly need to or as, as much as you need to. We want to be helpful. Um, and we have been really, I have to say, heart, you know, really warmed by the fact that so many people have stepped up in this time of need. But please use us and officials to be your resource to help you get to city agencies or resources as you need. Um, I will leave it at that. I just want to say thank you to the folks in the mayor's office as well who are on this call. And I know that he couldn't make it because of childcare today, but I also want to recognize that Assemblymember Dan Court's staff is here as well. And I did talk to him earlier. He said to say hello, but he is uh, currently babysitting two kids of his. So thank you to everybody. Please stay healthy. Please social distance and uh, allow us as elected officials to do whatever we can to be helpful. And thank I'll hand it right back to Councilman Kalos. Thank you. Thank you to Keith Powers. Thank you for being a great partner on the Upper East uh, side. I just want to add a quick 30 seconds. Uh, we closed our office back on March 11th. As you heard, we've been very focused on opening more beds in the district. There's 350 new beds that are being opened. They literally rebuilt them from scratch on Kohler Hospital, 350 beds. These are not for people who have coronavirus, though I'm happy to have anyone who has it in the district because I think we need it anywhere we can get it. Uh, and these are for folks who can't be discharged from a hospital but still need some care. And that's the offload, uh, uh, offload and empty beds in our critical care uh, public health hospitals. We also reached out to uh, Hospital for Special Surgery. That's the place you want to go if you ever have an issue with anything orthopedic, whether you're a New York football giant or just somebody like you or me. Uh, and uh, they've added 200 beds. We're now up to 550 beds just from this district that's new. We worked with Charter to expand their Spectrum Internet Assist to provide anyone you know who does not have broadband at home, if they have a student in the household, that student can get free internet for the next 60 days. Uh, we also worked with uh, an economist, Teresa Ghiraducci, around a five things we can do to save small business. It's very similar to what Councilmember Powers wrote three days earlier, uh, and uh, you can read about it in the New York Post. We also wrote a uh, thank you letter to all of our workers at Labor press um, for our teachers, our healthcare workers, our cleaners, our MTA workers, police officers, EMTs, utility workers, stunt workers, delivery workers who are keeping these the city running. Uh, these are really our heroes. I also want to thank everyone who joined us for First Friday when we took it online. We had about 70 participants then. And so without further, uh, uh, if you want to get updates, we're sending them out. We used to send it out once a month. We're now sending it out multiple times a week. Anytime there's a constructive update, you can subscribe to our newsletter at benkalos.com slash subscribe. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to the main event. The reason I think we got over 100 RSVPs for tonight's event, we actually hit 200. Uh, and that is uh, Dr. Barbo. She is the commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. She has over 25 years of experience in advancing health equity and providing health care in urban communities. Her expertise will help us to answer the questions and concerns we've sent in. She's going to take a number of questions, then she'll turn it over to Dr. Ray. Uh, but before we get started, I'll ask Dr. Barbeau to give us a quick update on where things are, and then I'll start with some of the questions that you submitted. Okay, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Uh, well, thank you very much, Councilmember Kalos. Uh, thank you to uh, Speaker Johnson. Thank you to all the council members on the line and the borough president and other elected officials for your ongoing support and amplification of the messages that we are uh, working to deliver to New Yorkers. Clearly, this is a once in a century event uh, that has tested all of us as New Yorkers um, in every aspect of our lives. And as I was hearing um, various elected officials talk about all that's happening in their districts, all the work that they've been doing, it just reminds me 
of how interconnected we all are. Uh, and I think to degrees that we probably took for granted before and that this uh, pandemic is now really highlighting how much we all really need one another, whether as, you know, the mayor likes to say, whether we are in wartime or whether we are in peacetime, we are New Yorkers and we need one another. Currently where things stand with this outbreak is that we are at over 70,000 individuals who have been tested positive with this uh, virus. The reality is, as I've said in other occasions, that this is a new virus. No one has ever been exposed to this virus and so no one is immune. And every day we learn something new about how this virus behaves, how it affects people. And as we learn more, we adjust our messages and our guidance to New Yorkers because our main focus is ensuring that we do everything and anything possible to make sure that we slow the spread of the virus and that we maintain the capacity of the healthcare delivery system so that we can take care of everyone who needs to be taken care of. So with over 70,000 people testing positive and that many more uh, not testing positive but having the symptoms, it's clear that we are in a phase of uh, addressing and responding to the outbreak that requires you know, the technical term is mitigation. And what that really means is having to put in place social isolation measures. And I really dislike that phrase, social isolation, because we're not asking New Yorkers to separate socially, we're asking them to separate physically. In this time, we need New Yorkers to come together virtually as you all are here, emotionally, spiritually, because this event calls upon us to really dig down deep and figure out ways and be creative as to how it is that we remain connected. As many of you have seen, and I have said from the beginning, there isn't one of us who will go untouched by this COVID-19. Every single one of us will know someone who has gotten the illness, may know someone who's hospitalized because of the illness, and may have heard of someone close to them who unfortunately has died because of the illness. Um, thus far, we are at over 3,000 people who have died because of COVID-19 and tested positive. And the reality is that there are likely very many more people who have died because of this illness and that we are working to ensure that we count every single one of them because every life lost here is a life too much. And it's a reminder again of everything that we're doing is not only to protect the healthcare delivery system, but to save lives. And so we're asking New Yorkers to remain indoors as much as possible because every time you stay home, you are helping to save lives. The other thing that we have done in terms of adding recommendations to the hand hygiene, to the covering your mouth and your nose when you cough or sneeze and staying indoors as much as possible is to wear a face covering when you absolutely have to go outdoors. Now the reason for that is because there have been recent studies and we've said to New Yorkers every time we get new evidence that documents interventions that make sense to help us, again, slow the spread. We're going to ask New Yorkers to do this. And so new evidence has indicated that people in the pre-symptomatic phase of the infection may spread the illness. So we are asking New Yorkers that when they go outside, we want them to use a face covering. We've been very clear that we don't want New Yorkers to hoard N95s, we don't want them to hoard surgical masks. We need to reserve those for our frontline heroes, folks that are seeing people in the emergency departments that are taking care of them in hospitals, our EMS workers, and so on. What we're asking New Yorkers to do is to wear cloth face coverings when they have to go outside. 
And it could be as simple as, you know, this scarf that I'm wearing, just making it a face mask. Or it could be, uh, you know, making your own face covering when you go outside. Um, I've got some samples around here. Um, but the point is that what we're asking New Yorkers to do is a layered approach to prevention. And we're hoping that, you know, these early, early signs that we're seeing that it looks like the volume to emergency, emergency departments is starting to slow. It looks like admissions to hospitals are starting to slow. We don't want New Yorkers to think, hey, great, I can now go outside and not use my face coverings. No, the answer is we need to double down on that because we're proving that it works and that it's saving lives. Um, there are other things, a few other things that I want to cover and I want to apologize um, because I see that we're running out of time and I may have to jump off. But Dr. Ray um, from the health department is also here to answer any and all questions that you all may have. Um, I want to direct you all to our website, uh, nyc.gov forward slash health. Every day we update the data that we have on people that are testing positive, hospitalizations, people who have passed away. There's lots of information about um, how New Yorkers can continue to stay safe in the time of COVID-19. So I want to make sure that um, you all are aware of that resource. Um, you know, people often ask me, when do we think that we may start seeing a lifting of all of these uh, social isolation measures? I wanna just uh, be, remind us to be cautious about lifting those too quickly because um, in many other places, lifting social distancing measures, doing away with all of the preventive aspects that we've put in place can very well lead to what we call a rebound effect, meaning that we can see those trends in terms of people getting positive and sick they may go down, but as we lift those measures, those uh, curves may go back up. And so we wanna make sure that we don't do that prematurely because um, as I said at the very beginning, beginning of this, um, none of us have been exposed to this virus before. And we need to be very measured in our approach to prevention and to the ongoing preventive measures that we want New Yorkers to take. You know, we've said publicly that we think uh, September will be uh, a reasonable time to expect a much greater uh, diminishment of new cases. But the reality is that how quickly we get to the other side of this apex will depend on how aggressively we can adhere to all of the social distancing measures that we have put in place. Um, and so let me then just end on hopefully not too somber a note, but really acknowledging um, the fact that this uh, pandemic is something that clearly no one has ever been through before. And it is normal for individuals to feel anxious about what's happening, to feel um, a sense of perhaps hopelessness, uh, anxiety, depression, all of those things are normal reactions and that's why it's so critical for us to remain connected. We want people to talk about how they're feeling. We want people to share how they are coping uh, during these times of asking people to do um, social distancing. And I wanna remind New Yorkers that we have a great resource here in New York City. NYC Well uh, is our lifeline for individuals who need someone to talk to. And so I encourage you all uh, to, you can uh, chat, text, call NYC Well 24 seven various languages. So why don't I stop there? I think I've got about maybe uh, five minutes for questions. And then, like I said, Dr. Ray can take over for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. We received a lot of questions. We put them all together and it looks like we have seven main categories. So I'm just gonna drop into uh, a, a group on social distancing. I'm gonna fire all the questions at you at once. 
Uh, first one was, what should we do if tenants in our building have tested positive for COVID-19 but are not quarantining? Um, can, can I get COVID-19 from somebody in the apartment next door? Are they allowed to walk their dogs if they wear a mask? What plans do you have to enforce social distancing for people who are not practicing, for example, runners? Conversely, given the importance of exercise, will restrictions be introduced on cyclists and joggers? Are there any enforcement policies for delivery workers to wear gloves or masks when they enter buildings? Similarly, for building service workers, what are your thoughts about taking children outside for walking, uh, especially keeping social distancing in mind, or is it better to keep them at home? And then the last one in this section, is it safe for me to visit my parents in their 70s if I quarantine for 17 days first? Actually, I'll, we'll leave that last one off for a separate group. Okay, um, so all of these are really great questions. And um, so I will answer them in totality and uh, we will, I think that'll take at least a good five minutes and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Ray. Um, so first and foremost, like I mentioned earlier, the important thing here is the layered approach to prevention. Right, it starts with good hand washing, starts with covering your nose and your mouth when you cough. It then goes to, if you're symptomatic, to stay indoors uh, and to wear a mask if you have to go out to seek care. Um, for everybody else, the important thing is when to stay indoors as much as possible, but when you have to go out for the essentials, to go grocery shopping, to um, seek medical care for other conditions. We want people to maintain six feet of distance. And the reason to wear the social, um, excuse me, the face covering is that because sometimes, you know, you can't really predict who it is that's gonna be coming within that six foot perimeter. There may be people who are essential workers that just can't um, adhere to that six feet. And we wanna add that additional measure of protection. We are not at this point recommending that people wear gloves. Again, the important thing is good hand washing. If you're not close to a water source on a consistent basis, then alcohol-based hand sanitizer is gonna be your best friend. We want people to go outside when they have to, and clearly exercise is a part of uh, maintaining our mental health. And so the uh, recommendations that we're giving is that if you're going outside running and you're able to maintain six feet of distance, then you don't have to wear a face covering when you go running. And so you may wanna choose to wear some kind of bandana around your neck so that when you stop running and you're going into your elevator or wherever it is, you know, you have the flexibility to then put it over your mouth. But again, when you're running, you do not need to wear a face covering. The other thing is, um, yes, we want people to go outside and walk their dogs. Uh, and if you can maintain a six foot uh, distance between yourself and others, you don't need to wear a face covering when you go out to walk your dog. Um, but again, if you can't predict that you'll be able to maintain that six foot distance, then having a face covering is a good way to ensure that you remind yourself of the importance of maintaining that distance. And it's also kind of like a visual cue for those of uh, other New Yorkers who may come in contact with you to say, hey, oh, wait a second, face covering, that's right, I need to maintain six feet of distance. Um, so Councilman, I think that covers the, the vast majority of the social distancing questions that you have asked. Ah, there's one more in terms of the um, compliance with quarantining. Again, we're asking people who, who are symptomatic to remain indoors for seven days since the onset of their symptoms or three days without a fever and without having taken Tylenol or ibuprofen. And then after that time is over, then they can go back to, you know, going outside in a limited fashion, using face covering, et cetera. 
Uh, there is no indication at this point in time that COVID-19, the virus that causes COVID-19, can travel through air vents, can do any of those sorts of things. So we are not advising uh, New Yorkers to take any special precautions if the person in the apartment next door to them uh, is known to have COVID-19. Uh, in fact, I would ask New Yorkers if they know their neighbor has COVID-19 to reach out and to offer to get them groceries, um, leave them at their doorstep uh, and then knock on their door and then go into your house so that your neighbor can then open their door and get their food. Um, so I think, you know, we are all living into this new reality and it's important for us to ask these questions because um, we want New Yorkers to feel safe in terms of carrying out all of the preventive measures that we're asking them to do. But we also don't want New Yorkers to unnecessarily uh, isolate themselves, nor do we want New Yorkers to stigmatize individuals who have uh, unfortunately contracted COVID-19. Um, so I think that that is um, a comprehensive answer. And again, I apologize that I won't be able to stay on any longer, but I hand it over to my very capable colleague, Dr. Ray. So thank you very much, Councilman, for bringing us all together virtually. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I want to just report to folks that if you know anyone who still wants to join by Zoom, we now have the Zoom working. We should be able to accommodate a lot more people now up to 500. And I want to thank the Commissioner for staying on until 6.52. Uh, we're going to ask Dr. Ray if... Uh, first, Dr. Ray, what pronouns do you prefer? Uh, she. Her, her. Okay, we will ask Dr. Dr. Ray if she doesn't mind sticking around and we're going to go through uh, six remaining areas of questions. The next question, uh, and, and my daughter says good night uh, as she uh, refuses to want to go to bed since she wants to watch and good night. hear the answers. Uh, if anti so on antibodies, I'm going to ask you four questions. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. If someone has been exposed to the virus but never presents symptoms, can he or she develop antibodies? If so, is there a certain amount of antibodies that would make a person immune or less likely to contract the virus again? Will antibody testing be an option? If so, when? How long does COVID-19 virus last before it leaves the body? Is it safe for people to go outside who have had the virus no longer do and have quarantined for two to three weeks? Do we need to be tested again? And are we candidates to donate plasma? We, we saved the harder questions for you. <laughs> All right, so I think I got all of these. Um, so uh, I guess I'll start with the fact that um, there's been a lot on the news about antibody testing, and I think some doctor's offices are offering antibody testing. This is a little bit of a complicated and a technical issue, but some of the tests that are out there have not been validated in a way that the health department is comfortable with. Um, additionally, we don't know everything about this virus. And so, uh, you know, even if you get a test and the test says that you have COVID antibodies, we don't know 100% that that means that you can't transmit any of the virus. And so uh, what does that mean, right? When, if I get sick, when can I go, you know, when can I go back to getting my groceries? When can I go back to going, um, you know, doing physical exercise outside like the commissioner was talking about? And you really have to go back to the guidance that uh, she described so well. And we really want you to think about your symptoms, right? And we're pretty convinced that the symptoms um, should guide your behavior. Now, everybody, uh, I've heard, I've also heard the other thing like, oh, well, I went and I got this test and it said I have an antibody and so I can go back to work, I can, um, you know, I can walk outside freely, I'm not going to transmit the virus and I'm not going to get the virus. Now, you know, a lot of the people on the call have talked about our interconnectedness, how we have to be kind to each other and take care of one another. Uh, 
and that's absolutely true. So we don't know 100%, especially you know if we're not sure about the quality of the test. Um, and I'm not saying all the tests out there are not good, but I'm saying we don't know which ones are good and which ones are bad. And for me, that's not enough for me to take a risk with the lives of my neighbors, you know, the lives of um, people's parents who are older, uh, the lives of people with certain medical conditions that um, mean they're more likely to have this, a severe illness if they catch COVID. And certainly not with our healthcare system, which if I go around spreading the virus, um, you know, we've, we've seen things get better, can get overwhelmed. And so I think that, um, you know, like some of these questions about the amount of antibodies, those are exactly the things that we don't know yet. Um, so really, our uh, the guidance that we talked about before we started seeing a couple of these uh, antibody tests pop up is the guidance we're following now. Um, I also want to say that that means that, you know, since, since these tests aren't changing your behavior at this point, uh, if you've been COVID positive, there's no reason to get tested again. We just, we don't know what it means. I think that, you know, you stay inside unless you, and if you feel sick, you have to be extra rigorous and not even take those small trips. If you're an essential worker, you, you have to stay home uh, if you feel sick. And I think I think I got everything. How'd I do? Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll throw you a softball. Uh... <laughs> How many positive COVID-19 cases are on the Upper East Side? Is there a website to track cases and deaths uh, that is uh, up to date every day? And how is information being made available to families and children with uh, limited resource? Maybe they are on the other side of the digital divide. They didn't sign in tonight's call and didn't find out that they can get free internet for the next 60 days and internet essentials thereafter. Uh, well, so for the data, I actually don't off the top of my head know what the number is on the Upper East Side, but uh, everybody who is not talking should uh, go, on, go to www.nyc.gov slash coronavirus, and we have a really great data page. It's getting updated every day. Uh, we're thinking of newer and better ways to provide information. Um, for people who want other information, you can always call 311. Uh, and I think there's a special line to take care of calls from uh, people who are healthy, who are not looking for a doctor. We actually have a whole dedicated section for people who want information about COVID-19. Uh, you can also text 692-692. Um, to get text updates about COVID-19 and what the city is doing uh, to combat it. And also sign up for, for internet. Uh, it, is, it is now uh, seven o'clock, which means it is uh, time for the uh, cheer. So I'm gonna unmute everyone very briefly so that everyone can uh, join me and all of our neighbors in the cheer until 7.01 and then we'll go back to questions. Uh, Congratulations on the... Thank you. All right, seven o'clock. That's why. Seven o'clock.
pops up in weird ways for me. Have all these reminders of and because of where we are. Okay, so you're welcome to continue to clap. We're going to continue on with the cases. Um, as you can hear from behind me, it's getting louder and louder every day. Uh, let's just unmute Dr. Ray. Uh, this is, if there is a silver lining, uh, th this would be the silver lining. Uh, so give me one moment to just uh, get back to where we were. Uh, so um, in terms of the questions, so you got the information question. So if you go to coronavirus, nyc.gov slash coronavirus, uh, you can click on the data page and it has all the information by zip codes. Um, I have the zip codes up. Uh, what you'll find is every single zip code in New York City has it. So it's not about just people in tall buildings or short buildings. It's if you're in a single family, you've got co you're dealing with coronavirus, or if you're in a tall building, you are. Uh, for the heat map on the east side, it looks like uh, 10022 has between 7 and 151 cases, same for 10044. Uh, for 1065, that is the 151 to 236, as well as for 10075, 10028. And then for uh, 236 to 409 cases, that's 10021, 10128, and 10029. Uh, and then we'll just go to the next question, testing. If I have symptoms, can I get tested? When will testing be available for everyone? Where is the testing for folks who don't have systems? Symptoms requiring hospitalization, can we set up some neighborhood options together? Will the people that are asymptomatic ever have symptoms and how long will the virus remain in them? Okay, so um, I'm actually, I'm glad you brought up testing. There's a lot of talk about uh, COVID-19 testing around the country and when will we get more tests? Uh, and so uh, Dr. Bravo talked about us being in a phase of what we call mitigation. And so testing uh, is more important at different phases of a pandemic. And so um, early when we thought very, very few people had, uh, had COVID-19, then there was an idea that maybe if those people were to stay away from people who didn't have COVID-19 until they got better, then we could avoid the spread of the disease. And unfortunately, we haven't really seen a strategy. This is a, this is a pretty tough, uh, it's a pretty tough bug. It's, it's pretty easy to transmit. And so um, we're past that phase in New York City. We have widespread community transmission. And what that means is you have to assume that every person you see on the street, uh, every person who gets sick has been exposed to SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. And so at this point, if you are healthy, if you are outside of a hospital setting or some other special settings, uh, getting that test and being and testing positive isn't actually going to change how you do anything, right? We, we talked a little bit about how there are some things that we don't know about the disease, right? So let's say, let's say I was feeling sick and I wanted, but not very sick, right? I was just feeling sick and maybe I was starting to get better, but I wanted to get that COVID-19 test. Now, I could, as I go out to that test, I might be um, shedding virus and exposing a lot of other people, exposing the healthcare workers at the place where I get tested. And then they're, of course, using up their masks, they're using up supplies to test me. Now, if I test positive or negative, it's not actually going to change what I do. I'm still going to stay at home for seven days uh, from the onset of my illness or until I have been, I've had no fever for three days uh, without any anti-fever medications like Tylenol or ibuprofen, 
whichever one of those two is longer. And so my behavior isn't actually going to change. Now, if I, uh, if I were healthy and I tested positive for the disease, I'm still going to act in the same way uh, because we know that a lot of people, we know that, that not everybody gets symptoms from this disease, and we know that it is uh, widespread around the community. Now, let's say I'm healthy and I tested negative for the disease. On my way home from that healthcare facility, even in the healthcare facility after they do the test, I could just get, I, could, I will be exposed to the virus. So I could contract it on the way home. And so even if that test is negative, it doesn't help me at all. And so, uh, you know, this may change later in the course of the disease. This may change um, as we as we reach later phases, you know, as we're thinking in that uh, far future about, you know, how we recover as a city, as a country, as the world from this pandemic, but not right now. And so we're asking people, especially if they're healthy, uh, not to try to go get tested. Don't go to your doctor and try to get that test because we need to work together and protect our healthcare systems from being overwhelmed right now. And did I get everything? I think so. We have about three or four questions left, and uh, then we will wrap up. If you have questions, they were uh, the questions we're asking were submitted by when you RSVP'd or if you emailed questions at bencalos.com. If your question doesn't get asked or answered, feel free to follow up with us at bkalos at bencalos or the questions email and we'll work with you to get answers from DOHMH. So we have three more questions on PPEs uh, and treatment, and then the last one will be getting back to normal. So on PPEs, uh, we're now in this universe where we're, we may be using whatever it is, whether it's a, a, a bandana or uh, something else. Uh, are there any thoughts on using UVC fluorescent lights to sanitize masks? Uh, yeah, so um, they did, uh, they have a protocol for using UV to, um, to sanitize masks at the University of Nebraska. There is a, a different protocol that's uh, being tried out at some hospitals in New York City, but we're certainly exploring that. Um, I don't think that that is the kind of thing that could happen outside of a healthcare facility um, or outside of use for a healthcare facility, um, but we will, we will update you if that becomes the case. Okay, uh, this is a question submitted by a constituent who knows a lot more than I do, and uh, <laughs> me reading this will make me look a lot smarter than I am, but I'm so grateful to have the best constituents in the world. Uh, these uh, two questions are about uh, treatment. Many doctors are now prescribing some version of uh, hydro, if you can help me with that one. Hydroxychloroquine, uh, and then the brand name of that is Plaquenil. As, 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 azithromycin zinc to treat coronavirus, especially in early to mid stages before serious lung function has been compromised, which is this combination cannot treat, yet other doctors seem oblivious to this or disparage it, relying on ventilators, which can have up to a 90% death rate. Uh, why aren't more doctors using the combination, and why is our Governor Cuomo restricting it to use only in the most severely hospitalized cases where it is already too late to be effective? Now, just key things here. I am reading a question submitted to some by somebody. There are a lot of assertions of fact in there. Those are not my assertions, but they are questions nonetheless. So please, uh, and then the second question is, what is the status on finding a vaccine and a treatment? Okay, so, um, so hydroxychloroquine is a drug that has been, um, there have been some anecdotal reports that were very promising uh, around hydroxychloroquine. There's another drug, chloroquine, which is like an older version of that drug with more side effects that's um, proved to have antiviral activity in, um, in lab testing. Um, both of those drugs, hydroxychloroquine has much fewer, uh, have side effects. There, has, there are trials going on uh, for hydroxychloroquine. 
but there isn't really evidence that it cures the disease. There are people who take these drugs chronically who have high levels in their system um, who have gotten the disease. So it's certainly not, you know, a magic bullet, uh, as you say. It's worth investigating, and that's why there, there are trials going on. There are trials in New York City that are going on. Um, but there's, uh, like everything, when you look at um, a pandemic, you know, there are, there are good sides and bad sides. And you might think, well, we don't know. And, and there isn't particularly evidence that it's more effective very early um, or that it will prevent you 100% from getting the disease if you, if you are very early in your course. Um, the other thing is that there are people who really do need this medication uh, for their serious chronic illnesses. So um, people with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, people with lupus, um, some people with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which is a disease where your blood can, also, it can actually form clots in very bad areas if you are not uh, taking your medication. And there are shortages nationwide. This drug is restricted uh, in a lot of places nationwide to because it's being prescribed or because it's being taken by people who may not actually have a benefit from it. And so, you know, outside of a trial, outside of a physician providing the drug, it's really not for for a known indication. Um, I don't think this is a big conspiracy or a cover-up. This is the way that science works, and we're, we are investigating it, and we're doing that as quickly as possible. Now, the combination of uh, hydroxychloroquine and the other drug mentioned, azithromycin, uh, was shown in one French trial to reduce the amount of virus on tests. That's not exactly the same as making somebody better. There's a lot, like I said, we still don't know about the virus and what the amount of virus in one person means relative to another. Um, and it was a very small sample. It wasn't. It, it didn't meet all the scientific standards that we use to say something is definitively true. And there was a there was a comment about using ventilators to treat in instead of using hydroxychloroquine. And it isn't really, it isn't a one-off of one or the other. Um, people who are sick enough that they need ventilator machines to support them to survive are given ventilators. And um, it, isn't, it isn't a matter of we've picked one or the other. Uh, people have to be pretty sick to need a ventilator. And unfortunately, that's why there is a high mortality rate associated with using a ventilator. But it's more that the ventilator is a sign that the person is very sick than that the ventilator is causing them to have a bad outcome. And I think, was there something at the end there that was a little Last different? I think there was. was uh, how close are we to getting a vaccine? So, yeah, uh, I, so I, um, am not a pharmacologist. I know that, uh, I think that there are, there are a couple ideas for vaccines floating around. I will say that a vaccine, so a vaccine is something that you give to a person who hasn't been exposed to the disease. Uh, and so we have to be really, really careful about who gets, who is given a vaccine. We have to test a lot of people before it can be deployed widely. Um, some vaccines are viruses that are not as strong, uh, you know, that are that we've tried to sort of knock out so that they can't make people sick. And if we, uh, like again, we go through a lot of testing and we're very, very careful about it. And so you wouldn't want to give somebody a treatment who wasn't sick that could actually make them sick. And so, um, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, a year ago I was, on these kinds of, uh, I was having these kinds of conversations about the measles outbreak in New York City. And measles is a disease that is, you know, very close, it's close to 100% preventable. But that's because we have measles, the measles vaccine is so safe because it's gone through this testing. And that's the same kind of testing, even if it's speeded up, is going to have to happen 
for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Our uh, last question, and we'll hopefully be wrapping up very quickly, uh, is just a, a series of questions about getting back to normal. So how do we get back to, to normal, whatever that will be, without a vaccine? Um, something that seems right here is just, is it safe for me to visit my parents in their 70s or a person who might be otherwise compromised if I quarantined for 14 days first? Uh, when, when is it likely businesses will reopen and people will be able to go outside again freely? And what are the long-term implications of the crisis for the healthcare system in New York State? I just want to answer a little bit of that last one, which is uh, in the 2000s, there was a, a hospital closing commission that closed thousands and thousands of beds throughout the state as we tried to get to a place where uh, we were seeing just as many patients as there were and um, my belief, and I may be wrong, is that we need to get to a place where we actually have surplus and we have a model where hospitals are operating where they're at 50 or 60% capacity and the rest of the wings are down and they're not really using it, but it's there for surges, but um, I'm not an expert. So I'll turn it over to the expert to, to tell me why I'm wrong and also give us some answers. Um, okay, well, I can, I can start with the, the hospital question since you brought it up. I mean, so my uh, my day job when we're not in the middle of a pandemic is that I work in the Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response at the City Health Department. So I love any plans that talk about surges, surge planning and redundancy of systems. Um, I think that the healthcare system is certainly going to survive this. They've done, a, I mean, our healthcare workers, and end the strong system that we've built through years and years of preparation and working together between the public and the healthcare system and the government has um, has been paying off. And so I think we're going to see innovation come out of this. I think that we're going to see. Um, I mean the the. I think we're going to. See a lot of providers that uh, have really been through have been through hell and are going to have a lot of experience, but also going to have a lot of. Uh, they're going to have seen their colleagues pass away. Uh, they're going to have been in the trenches, and so, you know, I think that our we clapped for healthcare workers just now, and I I don't think we're gonna I don't think it's going to be they're not going to forget it the moment it's over and we all go back to work. Um, and so I think that we're going to have to be very considerate of the long-term effects on healthcare workers. Um, I'm not, I, for me, uh, just working in this and talking, you know, being involved with the healthcare system every day, it's just, it's a little too close for me to, to look to the future right now. Um, you know, like we have we have just started to see things slow down, and I don't know, I don't know if it's you know, I feel like I'm gonna jinx something by talking about coming out of it. Um, but yeah, I think I, I don't want to I don't want to make a prediction about things that'll happen. Um, I do think that we're gonna we're gonna learn a lot, a lot of lessons out of this. Um, and then other parts of, of getting to normal. So I think the commissioner talked a little bit about this. Um, September is something that we had floated around uh, when we were several weeks ago when we were really starting about uh, starting to talk about staying home. But the I mean the real answer of when we're going to go back to normal. Monday on Easter. Depends. <laughs> I am going to say I can't be sure about a lot of things. I can be sure it is not going to be on Easter. <laughs> um, it so it really depends on all of us. You know, we're all interconnected. We all have to take care of each other. We have to take care of our healthcare system, and you know, it'll. It's not. It's not so much a matter of preventing, you know, trying to keep one or two people safe. It's really about all of us working together to make this 
uh, this pandemic unfold in a way that we can handle it in New York City, all of us together. And that means everybody has to do their part. So the more people that don't do their part, uh, the less the actually even though even though we might be you know stretching out uh, things like staying at home and things like the um, you know the the really awful economic difficulty that we we recognize the economic cost that this is you know causing to people in New York City really disproportionately to some people who um, already were in we're already in tenuous positions, um, but even as we, if stretching that out longer, it might be the whether we get back to normal or not, right? And so if we if we don't do our part, if a whole bunch of people don't do their part, um, then normal. Who knows when we'll get back to normal? If we all do our part, it'll be a while, um, but we will get there. Uh, how are we going to get to normal without a vaccine? I mean, we so we've seen other places in the world start to return to normal, right? And we've um, the truth is, with widespread community transmission, I mean, almost everybody will. Everybody is potentially exposed to this disease, and uh, a lot of people are going to get this disease in the end. And our own immunity is is what in the end we may rely on. A vaccine may come out earlier, but uh, the, what that means is we have to be able to take care of each other when we're sick, right? So we, we have to have a system where we can take care of each other when we're sick. Um, you know, we don't think about using our healthcare system. We don't think about that time when we're going to need uh, our doctors, our hospitals, our nurses, our pharmacists uh, to really save us when we're in a bad situation. And so what this is about is, is making sure that they are able to do that when we need them. Uh, and then about businesses reopening, I, I, you know, we've said September, but I, I don't know the answer. Again, not Easter. <laughs> I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank the 60 folks who stayed. I want to thank our Mayor Bill de Blasio for making you available to us. Commissioner Barbeau, who, who literally was on TV six or seven times while she was speaking to us. So she's capable <laughs> of being in two places at once. Our Congress member, Carol Maloney, for really delivering on the federal level. Speaker Corey Johnson, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, State Senator Liz Kruger, Assembly Member. Rebecca Seawright, I'm about to hop on her call next. Assemblymember Dan Court, whose staff was here and uh, uh, is actually a friend and neighbor and had similar parent care responsibilities. Council member Keith Powers, uh, we don't all do it alone, our staff from all of our office. And I just want to thank all of you on this call for being heroes by literally staying home to flatten the curve. And I'll turn it over to my team. I think they want to display a quick graphic for folks. Uh, as we end this meeting. I believe that graphic is going to, in, there we go. So thank you all, have a great night, and uh, we'll be in touch. Again, for more information, uh, you can email us, questions at bencalos.com, and uh, we hope to do it again. If you have any suggestions, let us know on how we can make this better. Again, thank you to everyone who participated in tonight's call.